I'm going to pick up where I left off uh, a few weeks ago, about three weeks ago. We talked about Ephesians 1 verse 3 and our spiritual blessings, our spiritual riches that we have in Christ. The power of the gospel, the truths of God's word that make us vastly wealthy and blessed regardless of our circumstances that we face in this life. Paul called our our circumstances momentary light afflictions. And the Lord wants to remind his people of these glorious truths that are written in his word that bring us life and joy and peace, uh, unrelated to even our outward circumstances because we're gonna live forever in him, amen? We're gonna dwell with the Father and Son and Spirit forever in glory. It's gonna be wonderful. Let's look at these verses here, Ephesians 1, verse three to six. Paul's writing the church in Ephesus, and it was a church that he pastored for a season Uh, there. And it's important to know that the community that was there was a very pagan community. They didn't have deep knowledge of the word of God. They didn't have a lot of religious tradition in terms of worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the truths that he's writing to them are meant to build this foundation in their hearts, to awaken love in them, cause them to thrive and grow into spiritual maturity. He says this in verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as we read this, I want you to note how many times it talks about being in something else. In other words, we're in the heavenly places, we're in Christ, we're in God's love. And I'm gonna highlight that in just a moment. Verse four, just as he chose us in him. Now the he is talking about the father. The father chose us in the son before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and without blame before him in love. There it is again. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory, of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Father, we come before you even this morning. Lord, we love you. And we delight in your word. We delight in the power of the gospel, the power of your word, Lord, to bring transformation, to bring about radical change in the human heart, the glorious mystery, Lord, that these truths, the work of the cross and the giving of the Holy Spirit would cause human hearts to be changed. What a glorious and magnificent reality that you've given to us. We ask you, Lord, that these truths would touch our hearts, that you would awaken in us, Lord, a deeper confidence in you, that you would increase our faith, that you would cause us, Lord, to rise up in this hour, confident in love, confident in you, to walk, Lord, in a spirit of truth without blame, holy before you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Paul is writing these truths because he wants to establish the people of God in the truths that lead us into spiritual blessings in Christ. And the pursuit of these spiritual blessings is enormously important for our lives because most people are pursuing blessings. They want their lives to go better. They want things to get better. They want their relationships to get better and their marriages, their finances. And so almost every person on the earth is pursuing some measure of blessing or increase in their life. They desire it. They want it deeply. But very few across the earth are pursuing spiritual blessings that have real meaning and continuity for all of eternity. We neglect them. We overlook them. The vast majority of people are ignorant of them. And so when Paul is laying out these glorious mysteries of the gospel, he's beginning to give us insight into the spiritual blessings that come through God by the Spirit in the new birth 
by the indwelling Holy Spirit that dramatically transform our lives from the inside out. There is an inward transformation that needs to take place. We look out at the media, we look out at the state of culture and society. We see that there's wars, we see that there's riots, there's chaos, there's violence, there's evil, and everyone is looking for the solution to these evils. Everyone is looking for the leader that's going to come and institute new policies and bring about social justice and great reform so that the earth can prosper and be wealthy. But unless the human heart is dealt with, there will be no significant change. The deepest issue is the transformation of the human heart and the gospel of Christ is the only truth, is the only message that brings about effective long-term, yea, even eternal change to the human condition and the human spirit. However, this truth, these truths are often neglected. They're looked over. They're seen as irrelevant. The gospel of Christ largely is looked upon in the earth as being completely irrelevant to the pressing matters of the day and the problems of the day. However, the Paul, the apostle here, he wants to convince us because he has been convinced by the Lord. He wants to convince us that these truths, every phrase that he is saying in this passage and many others, these truths are essential to the human spirit coming alive and living in the way that God has ordained. A life of prosperity, a life of joy, a life of satisfaction, a life of delight, a life that actually has continuity in the age to come, that doesn't just burn up at the judgment seat. All these things that we so often pursue, they're going to be removed at the judgment seat. The pursuits of this life, and many, many people, they live as slaves pursuing the temporal things of this life, and those things are going to be removed at the judgment seat when they stand before the Lord. And the Lord wants to convince us, he wants to instill in us truths that produce confidence within our hearts. Confidence, as we're gonna look at today, that we are chosen by God, that he has looked at us with such grace and mercy and kindness, and he says, you're mine, even before you know it. Even before you've turned to me, even before your life is all fixed up and you're so mature and godly, he says, you're mine. I've already chosen you. I've already set my affection on you because he wants the earth, he wants his people to be set on a trajectory of love and confidence before him. The knowledge of the gospel is not only the facts that describe our spiritual regeneration, which is important, that we through faith in Christ, are spiritually regenerated and that the gospel provides that reality in a way that no other truth does, that no other philosophy, that no other religion does. The human heart is dead, the spirit is dead, and it only comes alive through faith in Christ. The truths of the gospel, they speak of the change of our legal position before heaven. Now, this is very important because we have to know that legally we are backed by God proclaiming over our lives that we are innocent before him and that Christ and his blood is sufficient to remove all the guilt and all the sin and all of the shame that condemns us before God and brings us under his wrath and judgment. So the gospel is filled with these glorious truths that speak of the change of our spiritual condition, speak of the change of our legal position before heaven, but further, when we begin to grab a hold of these truths, the doctrines that are spoken of in the word of God, it unlocks the transformation of our living condition. It's these truths that unlock the thing that many of us are pursuing. We want our life to We want to walk in a greater measure of holiness. We want to walk in a greater measure of love. We want to walk in a greater measure of self-sacrifice and commitment to the ways of God. We want to have a greater passion 
for our neighbors and our cities. We want to have a greater passion for the poor and the lost and the broken. Those passions are awakened. Those things are changed and shifted in us as we come into a deeper understanding of the truths and the doctrines of the word of God. The doctrines of scripture, the truths of scripture, they always precede the life and the Christian life and how we express it. But a lot of people mix those things up. And they go, I don't wanna hear about doctrine anymore. Just tell me what to do. Tell me exactly how to parent my children. Tell me exactly how to run my business. Tell exactly how much I have to pray, how much I have to press into the things of God in order to be in. Just tell me exactly what to do. And the Lord says, I wanna tell you who you are before me. I wanna tell you of the change, the radical change. I wanna tell you of my affections and my love and my zeal. And in hearing that and in believing that by faith, it will radically transform what you do, how you parent, how you run your business, and how you live a life before God in holiness and blamelessness. So the Lord wants to instill these things into us. He wants us to grow in our holiness, in our perseverance, and grow into mature love. Now, you hear a lot about maybe holiness or maybe growing in love, but I wrote here intentionally to grow in our perseverance. I think that perseverance, patience, endurance, long-suffering, these are kind of all similar themes that are spoken of in the New Testament. They're some of the most neglected truths in the Word of God. The Lord wants to establish His people in perseverance, to not give up and to not give in, even under immense societal pressure, even under immense uh, social pressure and emotional pressure and relational pressure. The Lord says, I don't want you to give up. I want you to endure. I want you to cling to the truths of the word of God, the glorious gospel in the face of pressure. I don't want you to back down. I want you to stand for the things that I stand for and not be ashamed of the teachings of the word of God, not be ashamed of God's leadership, not be ashamed of the person of Christ, but stand firm in the faith for decades of your life. Paragraph B, well, this life of love and, and worship is undergirded by these profound truths. These truths about our spiritual blessings in Christ, about the Lord choosing us in him before the foundation of the, of the earth, they serve as an anchor for our life. They become the bedrock because all of us are gonna face temptation to back down from the truths of God's word. Now, let me just mention something on that. When we think of backing down from the truths of God's word, it's not just only being confronted with compromise in the culture that would compromise your sexuality, that would compromise the biblical stand on, on marriage or the sanctity of life. It's not just those pressures where people are compromising and the Lord wants us to anchor in truth. We want to be anchored in the truth that there's no condemnation in Christ so that when lies from the evil one come to steal away our identity, to compromise our stance of being accepted and loved and enjoyed by God, when those things come, we are also anchored in the truth of God. Yes, there is growing cultural societal pressure and we're aware of those things. We're taking our stand against those rising issues, but there are internal issues that are also rising within your heart, within my heart. We must stand against those as equally with fierce determination because the enemy is called the accuser of the brethren. So he is going to come to accuse, to lie, to steal away the identity and the power of these truths to get us to compromise these truths at the emotional level, at the heart level, so that we yield and we give in. Maybe I'm not accepted by God. Maybe I'm not enjoyed by him. Maybe I've got to do something to gain more of God's approval and his favor on my life. 
I need to change something. I need to, to outwardly you know, have this reputation of being more godly and more generous. And I've got to do all this stuff in order to get God's favor on my life. And so quickly we fall into that spirit of religion and that spirit of legalism. It's those lies, it's those things even that are warring within us. And the Lord wants us to saturate our minds in the word of God and the truths of God so that in the midst of our life conflicts, we're not interpreting our lens of our life is not being interpreted by the pressures that are surrounding us, by the angst that we feel, by the disappointment that we feel, by our negative emotions, by our bad attitudes and anger and rage and all of these things that come up in our hearts, the Lord goes, I want the anchor of your soul to be plumb line to the truth of my gospel. These truths must pierce you. They must transform you. They have to dominate your heart and your life. We want these truths to dominate our hearts and to dominate our life because the enemy is seeking to dominate your heart and life with fear, with anxiety, with doubt, with depression, he wants you off kilter and he wants you believing lies about yourself that are in disagreement with God and his word, his way. The way that we grow in confidence, paragraph C, is by applying the truths of the gospel to our lives over decades. That's why we need perseverance because this doesn't happen just one time reading through this. This doesn't happen at one altar ministry time where someone's praying for us and all of a sudden it's like, no, I get all these truths now of the gospel. So I'm walking out completely changed. I think that sometimes we want a shortcut. I mean, I know I do. I want a shortcut to walking these things out day by day, year after year, decade after decade. I want a shortcut. I don't want to actually walk it out grinding it out day by day. So I, you know, I'll use me. I come up to the altar call time and I'm just like, here I am, God, change me entirely right now. And he's like, well, that's not quite how it works. I appreciate, you know, we, we put the people on stage that have the testimonies of like the radical transformation. Their lives are a wreck, you know, and they're in drugs and, you know, Satanism and, and all this stuff. And their life is, you know, they've got addictions galore and all this stuff. We talk about their testimonies because they get touched by God. And, in one moment, and they're like, in one moment, I was completely free. Now, we bless God for that. We believe for that. We're going to contend for that. We've seen that. But that's not the rule for the vast majority, that's the exception. And one of the problems can be that we take the exception that somebody encounters Jesus face to face in their living room and he touches them and their life is completely, radically transformed forever. The rest of us are sitting around and going, what about me? I must be doing something wrong. Because here I am and the struggles from a decade ago are knocking at my door again. And I'm falling again into the patterns of self-pity. I'm falling again into the patterns of shame. I'm falling again into the patterns of compromising with my money or compromising with my sexuality or compromising with whatever it is. So something must be wrong with me. And the Lord goes, no, 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 nothing's wrong with you. And I love what Tracy always says, Tracy Bickle. She goes, we've got to walk this thing out. You have to work it out. You need a weapon in the war. This isn't just you get healed and then just kind of coast through life the rest of the time. Beloved, we're all in a war here. We're all in the same struggle, the same battle, the things that you're facing, the person next to you is facing. We're all in a war. And the enemy wants to fill our hearts with lies and our minds with lies so that we shrink back from the truths of gospel over the years. We stop pressing into God and our life becomes more bitter and we've got more unforgiveness and 
We're more dull spiritually. That's the trajectory that so many are on. The Lord wants to break his people out of that. But it takes by making decisions and determining, no, I'm going to fill my mind with the truth of God's word. I'm not just going to allow my mind to be filled with the prevailing narrative of the culture, what's going on in the news and the media, what's going on in the body of Christ kind of media. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to actually start putting something into me through the truth of God's word, believing on it, standing by faith in it, declaring it even when I don't feel it because I want those truths to come out of me. I want to live a life that's holy and blameless to the Lord. I want to walk in the love of God. I want people in my life to experience the love of God through me. I've got to declare war on passivity. And I've got to declare war on just kind of going through life and whatever is being talked about in social media is what's filling my mind. No, I'm not going to just give my mind to what's going on in the popular culture and in the earth. I'm going to give my mind to the truth of God's word. Your mind is sacred. It's meant for God. Your mind is meant to be set apart, holy before the Lord. He purchased not just your soul at the cross. He purchased your mind. He goes, I've got, an, I've got a, an agenda for your mind. He goes, that's my territory. That's my kingdom. I want my thoughts to rule and prevail there. I want my affections. I want my agenda to fill the mind of my people. And it not just be given so flippantly here and there and on these different whims and et cetera, et cetera. Paragraph D. A few weeks ago, we talked about Ephesians 1, 3. That the Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I mean, this is just incredible news. It doesn't always feel incredible because it doesn't always make all the pressures in our life today change. And so we're like, I like that I got spiritual blessings, but what about some other blessings, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like, where's the other stuff? Where's the good stuff? And Paul wants to convince us. He goes, no, 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 for real, this really is the good stuff. But God is spirit and he's holy and eternal And we as created finite beings that are so driven by our own desires, that are so self-consumed, we don't get how glorious the spiritual blessings are in Christ, not at at, at just a glance. The Lord goes, when you begin to explore the spiritual blessings, and Paul's gonna start talking about them in the following verses, when you begin to explore the spiritual blessings in me, He goes, you'll realize just how rich you are. When you realize that you're rich spiritually in me, that your life has meaning, that your life has continuity forever and ever and ever in my kingdom, that it has purpose, that you have an assignment in me, that I've commissioned you in this life and in the next, to serve my purposes forever. He goes, it's going to awaken your heart. It is going to produce a zeal for me, a passion for me. It is going to wake you up as though you're coming to life from the dead. Now, to be blessed, this is again review, means to be spoken well of or praised. He says, We've received every spiritual blessing in Christ in the heavenly places. Do you know what that means? That means that your life, with all of its weakness, my life, with all of its brokenness, with all of its failure, with all of its sin, the testimony in heaven over your life is that you are praised before the Father, that you're spoken well of in the heavenly places. Beloved, if there's a place that you want to be spoken well of, it's in the heavenly places. Forget for a minute how you're spoken of down here. You might be understood. People might speak poorly of you when you're actually doing pretty good. Maybe more real is that people are speaking well of you. You're actually doing not that good, but you're good at faking it. That's probably more the reality of where, you know, our lives are. 
I mean, people come up to me all the time, and they're just like, man, you know, Pastor, oh my gosh, I'm so blessed by you. You're so amazing. You're so incredible. And I'm like, ah, you've never lived in my house. You've never seen me at the end of the work week, tired, cranky, complaining, sarcastic. Like, you haven't experienced that. You experience caffeinated weekend Isaac. <laughs> you experience Isaac in the prayer room, just sitting there over in my corner, just enjoying God. That's the Isaac you experience. But you've not experienced Isaac when the chips are down and things are depressed. And if you have, I put on a good face and I faked you out. So now that we're just getting vulnerable and real. But the truth is this. It doesn't matter how, sp how people speak of you. Whether they speak well of you, whether they speak poorly of you, there's one thing that matters. How does your father speak of you? What's the testimony over your life in heaven? How does God evaluate your heart? Because only God sees into the heart of a man or woman. Only God sees. Man doesn't see what God sees. Man looks at the outward. He looks at the outward appearance. He, he checks your church attendance and he checks your kids and how obedient they are. He checks your spouse and how happy they are with you. He checks your finances. How wealthy are you? How well are you doing? What's the fruit of your life? You know, but only God can truly see into the heart. He knows the true motive. He knows whether we truly love him, whether our heart is truly set on that pilgrimage of growing in loving God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And I want to tell you that because of the gospel, you're spoken well of in the heavenly places where it really counts. Your name comes before the throne. And it's not the mature you. It's not the I finally figured out my life and got it all together you. It's the you that is weak, that is broken, that is sinful, that is flawed, that is just down here thrashing around. That's what it feels like. We're just trying to stay afloat. He goes, the power of my gospel is so glorious. The life of my son is so perfect that I will exchange the life of my son for you and his life becomes the testimony of your life before my father. You appear before heaven. The testimony of your life is the blood of the lamb that was slain. Innocent blood. That's the testimony of your life because of the gospel. We bring our weak faith before God. Yes, God, here I am. Save me. I don't know how to do it. He goes, that's enough. Now you're blessed in the heavenly places and spoken well of before my Father. Just take a moment and think about that this morning. That it's not because of you. It's not because of your merit. It's not because of your works. It's not because of what you've done and how holy you are and how great your prayer life is. The things you've done for God in ministry. That is not what has caused you to be spoken well of in the heavenly places. It's the perfect life of Christ. We've joined ourselves to him. That's why I mentioned earlier, noticed all the times that it says, in Christ in the heavenly places, in love. It's like you've been brought into Jesus. That's why we're his body. So when we appear before the Father, he goes, that looks just like my son. The very righteousness of God that's been imputed to you by faith in Christ. This is great news. Do you feel this already? I mean, I'm up here talking. I don't know if you're connecting with this, but I'm up here talking. I feel my heart connecting with these truths. It's causing my heart to feel joy and to experience the delight of God. It's one of the secrets of being a pastor is, is that studying the Bible and studying the doctrines of Scripture, it makes the heart come alive. It's glorious. 
It's freeing. It's liberating. It causes us to rise above the clouds of of shame and failure and all the things we're not doing right and go, oh, I'm spoken well of in heaven because my father has made a way for me through his son. There's nothing I can do to get closer or higher or more approved before him. He says, my blood has qualified you forever. Now you're spoken well of in the heavenly places where it matters the most. These blessings have caused the Christian to become unbelievably wealthy and secure, and for that, we can be overjoyed. We can delight in God. We can just relish in the truths of the gospel. We can wake up tomorrow morning and our life is still as dysfunctional as it is today. But guess what? You can wake up and go, oh, but I'm spoken well of in the heavenly places in Christ. I'm found in him. I'm secure in him. He has apprehended my security and my approval and it cannot be taken from me. There's no testimony, there's no devil, there's no demon, there's no lie, there's no sin that can cheat me out of being approved by my Father because I'm found in Christ. It's not my works, it's Christ's works. It's not my life, it's Christ's life. It's not my plan, I didn't plan this, I just got in on the goodies of the gospel. It's all about him. So Paul begins to tell us exactly what these spiritual blessings are. Again, he mentions them in verse three. And then he begins to talk about how they, they're apprehended in Christ and how they become ours, how it's freely given to us. Verses four to six of Ephesians one, they begin to describe the work of the Father, the intent and the plan of the Father over your life. He had a plan for you. Isn't it good to know that an eternal, all-wise, all-powerful father has a plan for your life? I heard someone say this, that the heart of the father, he, he was talking about the paternal heart, the father heart, and the maternal heart, the mother heart. The mother heart loves you as you are, but the father heart loves you for what you'll become because he has a plan for you. Every good father has a plan for his children, and he begins to see even from their young age, you know, the kid's two years old, and he's just banging on a pot in the kitchen, and the father says, oh, he's gonna be a professional drummer. (laughs) Probably. (laughs) You know, the kid's two years old. He's still in diapers. He's running around in a diaper in the backyard and he picks up a walnut and throws it across the yard and hits his sister in the head and she's crying and the mother comes out and she goes, I love you anyway. And the father goes, a future quarterback in the NFL. (laughs) The father has a plan for your life. He sees the end from the beginning. He chose you in him. You were in the Father's heart even before you were formed in your mother's womb. Even before he spun the galaxies into existence, you were in the heart of God eternally. And he had a plan for you. And he had a plan for your life. And he had a plan to redeem you and to bring you into his kingdom and to bring you into his family, not because of your own merit, but because he wanted to. Because he chose you in him. He said, no, I just wanted them with me forever. There's such power when the father begins to declare his plans over our life. Something awakens in us. Something begins to, to stir in us. It makes us feel secure in him. When we know that our father's have a plan for our life, and that they're working for our good even at their own sacrifice, even at their own expense. When the father is working for the child, there's something that awakens in us of security and confidence, and we go, ah. That's one of the things that the Lord wants to establish through these 
gospel truths in the heart of his people. He wants the body of Christ to take him in and go, ah, because so many believers, they love Jesus. They go to church. They pray. They give their money. But they live frantic. They live as orphans because they do not know that the Father has already set a plan for their life in motion. They don't have confidence in it. They don't trust his leadership. They don't trust their father. Why? Because they didn't trust their earthly father. They said, my earthly father didn't sacrifice for me. He abandoned me. He didn't love me. He hurt me. He didn't give me a vision for my future. He constantly brought up my past. See, these are the ways in which the enemy has come in. And he's hijacked the, the pains and the circumstances of our life and, and the trauma and the neglect and all the things that we've experienced to varying degrees. And he spun a lie inside of your heart that you don't have a father and that if you do, he's disapproving of you and you have to try more to be spoken well of in heaven before him. See the doctrines right here, Ephesians 1, verses three and four are dynamically practical to our life right now today. All of us resonate with the pain of rejection. All of us resonate with the pain of being overlooked, of being misunderstood. Right here, Paul is going, here's the plan of the Father for your life, verses four to six. Have you explored that plan? Do you believe that plan? Do you believe the, the truth of the one who authored that plan over your life? Verses seven through 12, we're under paragraph E, Verses seven through 12 talk about the work of the son in your life. And then verses 13 and 14 speak of the work of the spirit in your life. It's a whole family affair. Everyone has gotten into the mess of your life. And everyone is working together for your good in this Trinitarian mission for your life. You've got the Godhead working to prosper you to redeem you, to wash you, to establish you in who he's created you to be, you've got the power of heaven on your side. What do we have to fear? That's why Paul is so confident in the gospel in Romans chapter eight. He's like, I'm confident that death, nor life, no principalities, no blah, 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 can separate me from the love of God. Because I know I've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit working for my good to bring me into the glorious inheritance of Christ, to bring me into the riches of God, to bring me into eternal life, to bring me into his kingdom, to bring me into that which he has intended. Because it's a family affair. It's a family business. And he goes, I'm not going to withhold anything from my family, from you. I mean, one of the shocking things Paul says is that we're, you know, co-inheritors with Christ. <laughs> what? Because we're made sons, we get to share in the inheritance of the son. We get spiritual wealth and riches beyond anything we can imagine. That's why he says in 1 Corinthians 2, he says, eye has not seen and ear has not heard. You're gonna be blown away by what God has in store for you in the age to come. You can't even picture it. Your wildest imagination can't come close to what it will really be like, but it's fun to imagine. It's fun to try. Sometimes I, uh, of course this is made up, but sometimes I try and trick myself you know, because I always heard preachers growing up, it's going to be better than anything you can imagine. So I'm like, I'm going to take you up on that. 
I'm going to imagine the most ridiculous, opulent mansion in heaven. I go to prepare a place for you. So I've got koi ponds. I've got golden bridges. I've got diamond bunk beds. I mean, what are you guys thinking about? You better stir up your holy imagination. If you think it's just like a metal golden hut, and God's going to surpass that. All he has to do is put a little jewel on the top when you walk in. Like, there it is. I mean, that's all he has to do to kind of go beyond what you've imagined. I'm going for it all. I'm thinking that maybe he gives me a couple planets way out there or something. You know? Anyways, we're being... Let... <laughs> We didn't get through any of these notes even to think, let's have the worship team come out, but. <laughs> no, I'm. All right. The <laughs> golden No, I mean, I really do. I really do like trying to imagine the place that Christ has prepared for me. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. So like, what does the view look like? And where, is it way up on the New Jerusalem wall somewhere where I can like see down, you know? And I'm looking way up there and my parents are way higher than me. I'm like, hey, remember me, your son, way down here. Yeah, yeah. Who is the preacher you were listening to? <laughs> Oh, no comment. <laughs> but I mean, the Lord, I know we're being silly, but the Lord wants to awake our holy imagination. You know, Paul says, set your mind on things above. Set your mind on things above. Give your mind to the truths of the gospel. Give your mind to the truths of the age to come. See what it does to your heart. See what it does to your emotions. See what it does to the areas of pain and unforgiveness in our life. See what it does. See what it does to the areas of compromise. Paul says that the gospel is the power of God to salvation. To him who believes. Romans 1 16. It's the power of God. We want the power of God in our midst. Let the truths of the gospel, these phrases, open them up. Get, get before God. Ephesians 1. Take these phrases. Spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Oh, I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. I'm not the failure that people think I am. I'm in Christ. If I'm in Christ, I'm wildly successful. If I'm spoken well of before the Father, I'm wildly successful. If my heart is being pulled to the deeper things of God, and growing in love, tenderness, and humility. I'm wildly successful before God. Let's stand before the Lord.